You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. The website is offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins. Emily Moyer is with me, and we're going to introduce our guest in a minute. I want to take a minute to also speak to the fact that we have now launched formally our Patreon campaign. This is where you kick in support for what we do, and we in turn provide you with some of the perks and benefits that come with uh, being a patron of the arts, the sciences, the fine things, the esoteric things. So if that interests you, if you'd like to support us, there are levels of support. You can find us at patreon.com slash offplanetmedia is the web address. And we'll put that up with this, with this uh, podcast as well. We welcome you and we welcome your support, whether you support us financially or not. We know a lot of you out there support us spiritually and in other ways as well. And we appreciate all of that. Emily, let's introduce our guest. All right, guys. So we have a returning guest today. I had an absolutely fascinating conversation with her earlier this year and have been looking forward to round two ever since. Um, today, we're going to shoot the breeze on a wide variety of topics that have been on our minds. Um, what is the true purpose of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and where do his revelations ultimately lead us? Is there a conspiracy behind the fermented food and kombucha craze and is it related to candida, autoimmune disease and Morgellons? And has the degradation of our soil led to the uh, breakdown of our bodies and can we restore the biome of both our environment and our gut? She is one of the most curious and critical thinkers in our community and she's here to take us right back to the bottom of the rabbit hole. Sophia Smallstorm, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Well, Emily, thank you for that introduction. Again, I always don't, I feel I don't deserve these introductions, but honestly, what can I really say except let's just plunge in and do it, all right? All right, let's do it. So I heard you, um, so I heard you speaking with Mike Williams <clears throat> about um, having watched the little mini series that Richard Hall did about uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Um, and I had seen that as well and thought it was interesting. And so I was glad to hear you talking about it. And of course, when I hear you, I, I actually love listening to you on Mike's show because it stimulates all sorts of thoughts and ideas and further places the conversation could go. So um, I thought we could uh, start there and um, let, let's get into it. Let's let, let people know a little bit what, that, what you saw in that series and what it made you think about. Well, the first thing that I wanted to know was what does wiki mean? And I asked um, Mike, and he said it means internet. I said, no, it can't mean that. So I looked it up, and it actually is a Hawaiian word. And they say it, it like this, wiki wiki. Mm -hmm. And it means quickly, hurry, do it fast. And it starts, the story starts in terms of the internet with a guy called Howard Cunningham, who was some kind of geek, uh, software geek. And he was in Honolulu for the first time and he had to move between two terminals and some airport person told him to get on the wiki bus. And he- So actually, I'm sorry, let me break it as Ward Cunningham is the guy's name. That's short for Howard. Okay, all right. So anyway, Ward or Howard um, adopted this word and he, built a web platform, which was some kind of collab collaborative software, and he called it Wiki Wiki Web. And now, you know, in English, we say Wiki, we don't say Wiki. But anyway, so the Wiki or Wiki, in terms of when you apply it to what happens on the internet, um, it really means quick, instant. I like to use the definition instant. And leaks, what WikiLeaks does is it puts tons of information up on its server, and it's an instant information dump. That's what it is. So I started to read about WikiLeaks a little more. And I realized that as I was absorbing things and integrating them from the interview that was done by Richard Hall and Andrew Johnson, it's on YouTube. It's absolutely important that you see this. I'm trying to find the name of it. Um, it's in my newsletter. But we'll put the, I'll, I'll find it and I'll put, put the link up. in the description. Okay. I'll put it the link in the description. Very important. Box. They mentioned that not only does this Assange character have all these gaps in his 
life trail, like missing years when nobody knew yep. what he did. Yep. Um, he grew up in this thing called the family in Australia. Now, this is the same as the children of God, that there was a big internet. It is, it is the children of God as I understand it. It's a, yeah. It. yeah, and he was there from the age of 8 to the age of 16. It was his stepfather who was a musician who was a member. And um, that just threw me all over the place. And I said, oh, my gosh, now they've got somebody from the Australian family. His, if you look at where WikiLeaks um, has been hosted, um, nuclear bunkers, there was also a period when he was um, hosted by Amazon. And I'm thinking, how does he have these connections? A regular person like you or I could not have connections <clears throat> like this, you know? These kinds of um, host setups, these kinds of, there are lots of legal protections that are supposedly offered to journalists like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, but that's not real journalism. So I just started to wonder if this was a source of instant information for us that would send us scurrying to the dump and start scrabbling around. And of course, when they dumped the um, Democratic Party emails, the Podesta emails, what did we find? We found all these bits and pieces that related to ritual abuse, Satanism, pedophilia. And my sense was that they want us to know this. So I'll just pause there and let you guys weigh in. So, um, yeah, you know, all of the things you just said are things that have occurred to me for, I know for myself and other people I've spoken to kind of in this community and similar backgrounds of mine, we all have through some level of research, but also just our own sort of intuition and inner knowing understood that um, Julian Assange is, um, is and always has been um, a controlled person. Um, he's coming from MKUltra like projects, um, which, you know, there's a very, you know, the cults and, and projects are tightly wound together. You know, um, they're sort of, uh, funded, run, and observed by like the same groups and powers, um, you know, and it, it's obvious watching him. Like, I, you know, like it's one of those things, and to a certain degree, but a little bit different, same with Edward Snowden. Um, you know, so I have this kind of mixed set of feelings about Julian Assange where it's like, okay, like I see, like, and I think sometimes we're not I think sometimes we're seeing him sort of in one persona and, and, and other times in another. Sometimes I feel like he's working for, he's, you know, working for an agency or working for some control kind of power and he's well aware of it and he's in on it. And other times I feel like he's uh, sort of recognized, realized that he's in the middle of this thing and what he thought was happening is not what was happening and that he is the subject of something. Um, and the, the information that he releases you know, it's like one of those things with information. I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of the belief that like, you know, is information, if it's true, it doesn't matter where it's, it comes from, you know, and it's better to have it than not have it. But I also agree with you that like, you're releasing certain kinds of information in certain ways can cause people to have a certain kind of reaction. Um, you know, I think that I've, I've felt like one of the purposes of WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden <clears throat> is to release all this information and then see basically, you know, if the people do anything about it. And the people don't do anything, then they know that they have carte blanche to continue on with whatever, the, what they're, whatever they're doing. Um, and just to take, sort of take the temperature of the public and see if, you know, uh, is it just the conspiracy theorists that, that jump at it? Or if the general public actually takes a look at it and becomes outraged or, you know, becomes open to the fact that they've had most of the, you know, reality hidden from them to this point. Um, so that's kind of my feeling about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Um, Randy, what do you think? Yeah, just just to clarify things, this this family called in Australia <clears throat> was founded by Anne Hamilton Byrne. I don't think it's connected to the Children of God directly. I think it's an offshoot. So I want to correct that fact because the the Children of God in the United States was connect connected back to um, the famous Zen Gardner blow up of last year. 
<clears throat> so I don't want to speak too much about that. Um, in terms hey, of... I have to interrupt you. I yeah. did a lot of research on Children of God, and there was a division of it that later changed its name to the Family and Family International they did, yeah. Australia yeah. that was raided. So it's definitely the Children of God. And Hamilton Burns, okay. only the leader of that particular segment of it in Australia. Right, she claimed to be the reincarnated, reincarnated female version of Jesus. So <clears throat> that's interesting. I didn't realize that they were, if they were directly connected or not, because the children of God splintered into a number of cults, and they went all over the world. So, Well, they are known as the Family International now. They were called the Family after a while. They changed their name from Children of God because they got such bad press. Yes. Yeah. They started calling themselves the Family, and they had, you know, uh, setups, communities in all different kinds of countries in Africa. They've got their fingers in many different pies. I'm not saying that everybody who's a family member is, a, you know, a bad person, but um, I'm sure there are a lot of idealistic, well-meaning people in these particular subdivisions of this thing that's now called, I think, the Family International. But anyway, go ahead. What's interesting, because I pulled up an article while you were talking to, to fact check this, the article is Growing Up with the Family Inside Anne Hamilton Burns' Sinister Cult, and it actually discusses Julian Assange. There's a couple interesting factoids here. One is that followers, including children, were given massive amounts of LSD, and that Assange himself admits in his childhood to having a male figure in his background who he called a sinister presence. Now, that kind of profiles to me as sort of a CIA. Uh, project often type program where they're using a lot of drugs and the figure in the background could very much be a handler figure that would have been inserted into the situation. So it profiles a lot, which I've suspected for a long time, as being uh, an adjunct to CIA mind control programs. You know, I'd like to comment on what Emily said about the temperature taking of the public with these information dumps. Um, I feel that they did intend for us to root out this pedophilia thread and to build on it and build on it. And I believe it will eventually become known to the public at large. It, it's a part of a desensitization scheme. But I think if you try to, to lay out a Hegelian dialectic around it, I think that they are pushing for the average American family to embrace the idea of chipping children, chipping everyone. Because what led me to this thought was that prior to 4th of July, I was watching television news, which I occasionally do just to see what they're talking about. And Channel 7 proudly announced that 1,000 dogs in San Diego were chipped that week in anticipation of the 4th of July firecrackers fireworks, which would um, send these dogs hurtling over their fences of their backyards, and they might never be seen again by their owners. So 1,000 dog owners in San Diego chipped their dogs. So I'm thinking, all right, well, they want everybody chipped eventually. And if they scare people enough with the idea that there's, you know, um, children kidnapped, strapped, snatched off the streets, and then they're used in ritual abuse and um, no, they can't be found again, and this might happen to your child. So that made me think in my very, you could say, even over-imaginative mind, that there are going to be documented children and undocumented children. We know that the, um, the in vitro industry is very, very busy trying to create uh, humans, not just in petri dishes, but in artificial wombs, right? They're heavily soliciting sperm donors, sperm donation, egg donation from college students, paying them, you know, it, incentivizing them with cash payments for this. They want a genetic pool that they are going to certainly do all kinds of experiments with. So it made me think that there will be real children, documented children with paperwork who belong to real families and have parents who are present. And then, because this other, this technical baby making is so, um, in such high development, 
they're probably going to develop what I call undocumented, paperless children. And suddenly, a time will come when it will be said that the chipping has been successful. There are no more abductions of children. The pedophiles are not able to do so because the children would be found. But in behind the scenes, what will be fed to the pedophile circles will be the undocumented paperless children made in the labs in artificial wombs. Wow, that goes into a whole, a whole different realm of, of discussions right there, Sophia. What we know is that the Freemasons have been doing a program since probably 2010, 2011, an active program of digitally profiling children, taking their uh, DNA samples, fingerprints, current photograph, compiling a database, which is beyond creepy when you consider Freemasonry sits in, inside of the, the whole juggernaut of this, 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 these mind control programs with the CIA. So the CIA, the Freemasons have been bringing this forward very publicly, both in the United States and Canada in terms of creating a digital identification system for children. Isn't it part of biometrics? Absolutely. Um, so when, you, when I heard you kind of speaking about some of that, Sophia, like my mind went many, many different places. Um, I thought it was very interesting. And um, I certainly think that's a possibility. Um, you know, I do think some of the appeal for certain, with the pedophilia, with kids, with certain kinds of sacrificing, sometimes does have to do with certain... Uh, genetic bloodlines, but it's possible that still getting children with that with those you know genetic traits could be accomplished through the technological means that you're that you're speaking of. Um, but what it made me think about was, oh, wouldn't that be interesting if like what I've noticed with the with these pro all of these projects is that it's something that is intensely directly targeted on a small group of people or smaller or particular individuals while it's sort of worked on, sorted out, seen how it can be used. And later, they always turn it on the public in mass. So wouldn't it be fascinating if Julian Assange had been part of some kind of project where they were shipping children for the opposite reason, for, 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 for you know, putting them into cults or putting them through these kinds of projects, always knowing where their asset was and ultimately having a plan for them, in this case, the plan that he will be the person that brings this information to, to the world. And maybe he thinks it's his own idea, maybe he knows it's controlled, who knows? But they've been controlling the actions of a small group of people while they go about sort of setting all of this stuff in place with the ultimate idea being that it will be turned on the mass public. So what it's possibly possible that Julian Assange has been brought to this place to this point through the same process that you were describing would would be done to the children at large, the, mo the documented children, but for the exact opposite purpose, for the purpose, of, you know, like for the purpose of, um, I mean, not not completely exact opposite, but the idea before is what you're saying is the idea being presented to parents is that by having your child chipped, they won't be in danger. Whereas if Julian Assange, as I believe that most kids in some way or another, whether it be through a physical trip, chip or other kinds of surveillance, have been tracked and traced through, through their life to fulfill a certain purpose, this would be to prevent that very thing from happening, but using the same kind of technology that is ultimately of control. Well, what this really does is this creates public acceptance for existing programs. We yeah. know, we know you and I know that they have been profiling and tracking children post-World War II period using genetic profiling. And we know that they have been establishing programs to identify certain markers in DNA that are, are tied to inherent character traits, abilities, and things like that through programs like MKUltra. Now, when you look at Julian Assange, he profiles as a classic, even just from his appearance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to be too cavalier about this, but blonde hair, blue eyed is kind of a hallmark of a, of a classic MK Ultra ideal child to them. So it, there's a genetic aspect as well to this. And I don't want to pull us too far away from this, but what if, just what if, we're really creating the pretext 
for large scale cloning as a result of harvesting all this information? You know, I want to put a term on what Emily was talking about, and then you also referred to it, Randy. The selection of somebody in their youth, whether it's for physical um, characteristics, uh, the placement, the convenient placement of Julian Assange in this family context. But this term is called rising star. And it's a yep. term that's used frequently in the media. I was um, informed about rising stars uh, to start with by Kay Griggs, the whistleblower, yep. uh, wife of George Griggs, who was a colonel. Mm -hmm. And Kay Griggs explains in her videos that are now on the internet that rising stars are very, they go kind of vertically through our society. They are strategic assets who are selected for intelligence, government operations, world leadership. They are picked out as children and they are handled from a young age and you know, inducted into this world that they'll eventually be participating in. And a lot of the ritualistic things done to them are very traumatizing and painful, including sexual abuse in order to make them um, submit to authority and power. Yep. So what happens is, though, the term rising star pops up all over the place. The media uses rising star a lot to refer to very successful lawyers, doctors, um, super lawyers, super doctors, they're called. And then Obama was called a rising star. I think Julian Assange was also a rising star. And he has been pre-selected for these various functions, which now, now he's some kind of authority on world news. He gives, he pronounces these opinions, and I just saw one yesterday. Julian Assange says, such and such is more dangerous than such and such. And there are people who t completely believe in him. They don't have the kind of skepticism that you and I seem to have about him. Like, where did he come from? There was a time where he was in grad school in Australia, and um, I think he was a mathematics student, and he was working on a DARPA program funded by the United States, foreign students. So it could be that he was shipped, as you suggest, and they kept track of him this way. So anyway, I just wanted to add that term into our discussion, rising star. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question in my mind that he was destined for this kind of role from, you know, from an early age. I mean, these projects are about doing a lot of different things with a lot of different children and finding certain people for certain roles. And some of those roles are this kind of, um, you know, they know that this person is controllable enough that they can take them all the way to the top. Other times there's people with <clears throat> certain skills, knowledge, ability that, you know, they try, they want to experiment on and do tests with and play around with and take advantage of, but ultimately that person is not controllable enough or for some reason, you know, uh, doesn't fit the right bill to become one of these sort of publicly rising stars, not that they aren't just as used for stuff in the background, but absolutely that with Julian Assange. And I well, think- he also, he good. also profiles very much as a cutout, which- uh, Totally. A, a one-sided asset where basically um, they're like a funnel. Basically, information is transmitted to them. It comes out the other end in a very contained format. And Assange profiles is that. WikiLeaks profiles is a cutout operation. Yeah. Just, just on the basis of how information is transmitted to WikiLeaks in an unvetted process, which is then set up to become an authority. How interesting it is, too, and when I looked up the definition, it took me to Wikipedia for cutout. So Wikipedia, by the way, is now the authority of st the standard authority on the internet for almost everything, despite the fact that most people understand that it is not authoritative. It has supplanted all the other encyclopedias and research formats out there as being the standing reference. I've seen even good researchers use it. So, in a sense, a cutout operation has now become an authority on the internet. Well, I would say because it's an instant definition or explanation um, or you know, reference to go to, that's why people go to it so fast. It's handy, but if you really want to use it in a discriminating way or a discerning way, you have to read it with healthy skepticism. But I want to tweak what I said about the paperless children and throw in one. Yeah, go, please. Ball. 
And uh, that would be this, that if it, then remember, I'm speculating, that is all I am doing. I'm using what I admit is somewhat of an active imagination. <laughs> and I'm saying that this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. So if the ritual abuse uh, field is supplied with what I have called the undocumented children that are created in labs, then imagine what would happen, what it would do for them to be able to obtain a documented child for their nefarious practices. Once in a while, it's going to be inevitable. Children will get lost, will disappear, but not at the rates that they're, this is happening now with the FBI not keeping track of it. So I had listened to an interview, I think it was, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was looking into how many people disappeared. 411, yeah. Yeah. My God. And so this would be a natural way to get a few documented children and get them into that horrible, unimaginable world. But I think that that would create, that would be like the cherry on the Sunday for well, them. Yeah, well also what about, I, I, we, we, this has been discussed a lot about Dave Politis' work, which I think is fascinating and interesting. And um, those, a lot of those people that are disappearing, he's noticed that a lot of them have very interesting traits, like some of them are returned alive, some of them not, but a high percentage of the people that go missing are either genius, people who are like a genius level and like top of their field in, in something that has to do with intellect or physical ability, or on the flip side, people who seem to have some kind of disability or autism or something like that. And so what if these people that are going missing are being pulled into, you know, underground bases or laboratories and having their genetics harvested to be used to create some of these kinds of undocu uh, undocumented bodies that you're speaking of? They might want a specific combination of things that make these undocumented children very easy to control, but have some ability to do this or that or, you know, almost super soldierish, you know, kind of qualities or drone kind of qualities. Um, I think it's fascinating that you brought that into it because I've often wondered if like that's what sits underneath national parks is just in, 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 in you know, enormous underground cities that are full of uh, gen genetic, genetic uh, laboratories and uh, clone storing tanks and things like that. And, you know, there's being an entire population erected from underneath our feet. Right, and that's why this is so sacred, the National Forest. And they yeah. have this, you know, fanfare around it of, oh, we must protect our National Forest. Now, I'm going to say something else. I was watching something on television, and it struck me that you're not going to, well, you're going to immediately jump on what the point of this was. But they showed it was some kind of, you know, discovery or I don't know what special it was in one of those weird cable channels. Some woman had been abducted in a national forest by a run-of-the-mill vagrant type, right? Not the feds or anything like that. And she was kept in a van, and she had um, her cell phone with her, but it was useless because there was no cell tower within range. So guess what they've done now? They put cell towers in all the national forests. And they even have the trails with a sign that says, you should thank Verizon for this trail because... They're the ones who sponsored, you know, the upkeep, and they have their cell tower here to help you in case you get lost. So those government facilities are now able to communicate with the outside world more readily because they are not as um, remote. Even though they might be underground, there might be big labs, just as you say. There's an initiative out there as well, by the way, and I've seen this documented in tech magazines where people are donating their used Android phones these phones are being deployed out in the wilds as well as this ad hoc network system supposedly to uh, document nature. But what they basically set up is what's called a mesh network using old cell phones, which creates a sequential transponder system within the forest themselves. So now you can't even get away from Wi-Fi signals yeah. and electromagnetic fields in what's supposed to be pristine nature. How is that not pollution? Yeah, no, I was just thinking the same thing that like, you know, having this like, missing person things then becomes a reason to have the technology available yeah. in the national parks. I mean, for me, 
Um, I live in the probably the biggest soup of technology there is, uh, other than maybe like Tokyo or something, right? So I live in Los Angeles, and like I always am looking for places where I can escape to to have like a few minutes, a few hours, or even God forbid, a night of sleep without uh, frequency interference. I remember when I was in um, Moab last fall, and I was in the Arches oh, Park. Like I went into, the, I found this little. I, I climbed to the top of this rock, and I found this little crevice, a little hole in there, and I laid down in the rock for like 45 minutes or an hour just to feel what it was like to just actually be alone with only my thoughts and only my frequency and, and whatnot. And they, they certainly would um, have no problem with taking that away from us because if they want to be not only monitoring our whereabouts at all times, but with the kind of uh, technology that we're increasing to actually monitoring our every sort of thought, feeling, breath, everything, then they can't allow us to have uh, a moment of silence out, <laughs> out in nature. You know what I mean? Uh, but also, I do think that sometimes some of these places where we go and there is no reception, uh, it's always been, maybe it's been that there's no reception for us, but there's uh, other networks functioning, you know, other kinds of mesh networks functioning, you know, that uh, allow, you know, certain parties to still uh, be able to track and trace and understand what's going on in certain spaces. Well, sure. I mean, they could be doing anything that they want to do, but I'm just saying they can now participate more fully, track us, watch us, as they always mm -hmm. could probably. But to have, you know, a cell tower in the middle of a national forest mm -hmm. just in case somebody gets lost, um, and they put this value on human life, you know, ooing and aahing about how important one single individual life is when look at what they're doing to all these lives. So to just stray again, I'm, we're straying. Stray. For, stray. Stray as far as you want, dear. We love it. <laughs> so I've been writing a double issue newsletter now. And I just want to tell people you're always welcome to subscribe to my newsletters because they are the way that I really share my dabblings with the world. And then Mike of Sage of Quay has been kind enough to insist on doing an interview each time I write a newsletter. So this is how the public at large, the listening public can get in on what I've been scrambling around in, which part of the rabbit hole network. But you can subscribe. And on my website, aboutthesky.com, there is a... a an icon for the newsletter and you'll find out from that. Anyway, not to say too much about how to get my newsletter, but I am writing a double issue now on radiation, both ionizing and non-ionizing. And I just want you to know that Marie Curie, who, di who discovered radium, died of aplastic anemia because she carried, not only did she handle so much pitch blend in the years that she was trying to get radium out of it, but she carried vials of radium in her pocket, commenting on how they glowed in this fairy-like way. She kept it in her desk drawer. And aplastic anemia is a kind of cancer that involves the complete shutting down of your bone marrow. You just don't make cells anymore. You don't make red cells, you don't make white cells, you don't make platelets. And what I'm learning now about all the different kinds of radiation, which I've always known to some extent, but I haven't known how it works. We are electrical. And I just interviewed Janice Barcello, who put this into my head even more deeply in a way that I hadn't been able to understand before. She said that the crystalline conductive materials in our body are, and we have tons. The body is piezoelectric. This is my new discovery. Muscles. Moving a muscle involves piezoelectricity, mm -hmm. which means this, um, the application of pressure or force to crystalline compounds that release voltage. When you squeeze, contract your muscle, it produces voltage. The voltage is the work you're doing, the energy you're expending. That's what gets you to move. And we are piezoelectric in the... Um, in all our different tissues, the crystalline proteins in your DNA are piezoelectric, which means they produce voltage, they, receive, they can receive voltage and generate frequencies, they can receive frequencies and generate voltage. So in the, the bath, the bath of electrical energy they are putting us in, they are really messing with our innate ability to be receivers and transmitters of the profound experience of reality in, from its spirituality all the way to the 
best of our cognitive functionality. We're electrical and they put us into a condition where our crystalline compounds are squeezed and pressed and messed with so much that we become completely dysregulated on the cellular level, the level of cellular energy. And we are unable to process and transmit the fundamental truths, powers, visions, creativeness that we should be able to express as living, vital human beings. This is the reason. It's not just to monitor us. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I agree completely. I think there, you know, somehow our body is being, uh, the, we're being robbed of being the ability to use our body for, and, our, and our minds and whatnot for what it's supposed to be used for. And instead, that, that is being used for something totally else. And um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, the, the, what I, I mean, you can, even, you can see this. Like, humans don't seem to be human anymore. They seem to be functioning like something else. They don't have, you know, clear thoughts, visions, ideas. Uh, awareness of reality, ability to function that, you know, humans once seemed to have. And instead, there seems to be this sort of... Um, it's like a flat response, a robotic dimensional humanoid type yeah. being that you see with responses that are entirely... Just, just the rage level... I mean, I don't live in New York or Los Angeles, but I lived in New York City in the 70s, and you saw it there then, the level of rage and emotional response, largely as a result of being in a very highly densely packed metropolitan area. But what we're seeing now, and I'm seeing it everywhere, because I, <clears throat> I travel enough that I see it, is that people are now so reactive that almost anything triggers them. And I can't help but think, based on what I sense and what I feel, even in my own body and my own responses, is that we're now these conductors of these electrical surges that are running through us that are tr triggering what were at one time modulated, moderated emotional responses. And it's like a short circuit. It's like you go from calm to axe murder in 2.5 seconds now. You know, Randy, I would say they're taking the being off and out of the term human being yeah. so that yeah. simply into humans and i have a theory and this will lead us into the um maybe the third part of our our planned discussion if you like but i've been thinking a lot about microbiome the human microbiome and i find it fascinating we contain house on our skin are zillions of bacteria mm -hmm. and right and inside our digestive tract and the digestive tract starts in your head it's in your sinus passages your nose esophageal esophageal tubes all the way down to your stomach your rectum and um, bacteria live in our body fluids they're in semen they're in they live in certain glands and tissues um, so they're everywhere and we have a very important, a crucial symbiotic relationship with bacterial life forms. They are the regulators of our health to a huge extent, I've learned. But here's the deal. Microbiome refers to the colonies of bacteria that each of us carry. You have your microbiome, I have mine. We, I believe, this is my own crazy brain thinking, so Emily will like it. <laughs> and. Um, so I've been thinking, we're not supposed to be around too many different microbiomes. We're supposed to live in our little family cluster with a few kids, maybe in a village. We're supposed to have plenty of air circulating everywhere. We're not supposed to be touching doorknobs and things that everybody touches, money, you know? And we innately dislike being exposed to too much microbiome. So um, I'm gonna give you the example of this is a little bit of a... Sophia, can I ask you to define microbiome just for anybody and probably even me who doesn't completely know what that term means? Microbiome means the colonies of bacteria and fungus forms, fungal forms that live on your skin, that live on your skin, Randy, not mine. You have your microbiome, just like you have a wardrobe in your closet. 
I can't fit in your clothes, I wouldn't wear them, you would not wear mine. So the microbiome is something we have and contain that is, is in, in de, del, delibly a part of who we are. And our health, our biological functionality is intertwined with the type of microbiome we carry. So I'm gonna give you an example. Why do people kiss? Why do they French kiss? Come on, think about it. Is it gross? Yes. Small children think it's totally disgusting. But why are they doing it? Men and women, or now let's include the people in the you know homosexual, lesbian world, they do this because they are exchanging microbiome. It's in the saliva, it's in the oral tissues. They are getting used to each other's closeness because they intend to mate and live together. This is the biological idea behind kissing. Oh, I really like this room. I'm going to kiss them. I'm going to exchange saliva and tissue materials with them and see if I like it. And then we're going to live together and we're going to have babies and we're going to be a family. That is the beginning stage of microbiome exchange and exploration, right? Yeah. So we are supposed to be around only a few other people's microbiome. And we can't stand, it's not, it's not normal, it's not, it's not really tolerable biologically for human beings to be around so many microbiomes as you would be in a big store at a concert. You don't want to be near all these people. It's too much infusion of too many different kinds of bacteria that have habituated to somebody else's body. You're supposed to be in a small, select microbiome context. Okay. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I, have a, I have a big question that <laughs> might get me in a lot of trouble, but no, I'm, I'm okay with that. When you're talking about this, and I was thinking about this after you and I had a conversation a few, a few days ago. Is this, so if we're only supposed to be around a few people and since, okay, again, in a certain environment, that would mean people who are sort of part of our family or part of our tribe, right? Like, you know, we're not supposed to be mixed with all of these things, the like tons of things. Is this sort of like, does this lend itself? Is this part of why tribalism exists? Is this like the body's way of communicating to a person's consciousness or whatever, yes. that these are the people I like, these are the I ones like that I want to be around? Is this like, and is, are we like, <clears throat> it's kind of like we're in this situation now where, let me just clarify this by saying, I am a person that um, enjoys, enjoys uh, culture of many cultures i enjoy people of all 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 different kinds but there it is obvious to anybody who's paying attention that there is this forced or enforced kind of multiculturalism or integration of people of all different kinds of groups and whatever going on and is this um a is this like part of a whether it's a um something being done intentional, oh God, like it's intentionally, like on a conscious level or like wrapped into this sort of conspiracy to rob people of their own identity. Is it also, I mean, this go, takes that all the way down to the cellular and molecular level. And is our, our, is people's rejection of others who are too different from them part of the bodies protecting their own natural internal health? Does that make any sense what I just said? There are different biomes for different kinds of people, absolutely, because there are different skin types. For instance, darker skin has a lot more melanin in it. Melanin is a structural component of skin. It strengthens skin. It is a converter of ultraviolet radiation into thermal energy. It gives, um, you know, density to the skin. It strengthens it. And so melanin, melanin-filled skin will attract a certain type of microbiome, a biome. And then there will be the diet of those people, you know, people who live on a diet of fish and, live, you know, Eskimos and living in igloos, they're going to have a completely different microbiome from somebody who's living in the heart of Africa, in the jungle. So yes, but what's really important is that, for instance, let's talk about cervical cancer. They always say, oh, if you have too many sexual partners, that's a risk puts you at risk for cervical cancer. Why? Why? 
You know why? Because it's too many different microbiomes that are entering your body. Your body says, okay, I can't handle all these people's microbiome that you're exposing me to. So we become, the cells become wicker, weaker, wiki wiki is on my brain now, <laughs> <laughs> weaker, sicker, and more feeble, enfeebled, if they have to deal with too much microbiome. And the first time I really noticed this, although I had no explanation for it, was when I left California, having moved here, this was in the early 90s, and I visited New York City. And in California, you are in a kind of bubble. It's, you have your car, you take that everywhere. You don't do public transportation. You're not swept on the street with tons of people walking at a fast pace as you are in New York. And I did not want to touch the door handles of restaurants. I didn't want to touch anything in New York. I kept asking my friends who were going around with me who lived in the city to, can you just open the door? I don't want to touch the door. Why? What's the matter with you? And it was because my body had an aversion to this much microbiome. I was by now deconditioned to it. Yeah. No, definitely. I, I lived in New York for about a year, and one of the things that I definitely noticed was that I just felt filthy all the time. And I was talking about actual, like, dirt. But what is in all of that dirt? What is in all those things I'm touching? I mean, you're on the subway. You sit where 200 people just sat in the same day right before you. You touch all these door handles. I would just, I'd never experienced a level of filth that I, that I experienced there just in terms, even in places that look clean, I'd get home, the bottom of my pants would be black, there'd be black stuff under my fingernails, even though I thought I hadn't touched anything. And so, yeah, like it, it is, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, ma you know, a sudden massive exposure to like everything. And there, you know, there's people there from all over the world that are coming with their own, you know, <clears throat> their own, the own biome for them, their own environment and their own body. And it's all being mixed around there it, it, i mean i almost wonder if that's part of the creation of the so chaotic what, we're talk, what we're talking about is biological diffusion then and in turn some sort of desensitization because if we're polluting if we're if we're mingling our microbiomes are we not also di diluting our own energy field our own biological processes as well which opens up the whole question of how far down biologically does this go in compromising things like our immune system? Well, I want to make a distinction because you have a biome in your gut. It's called the gut biome. And that you should have 20, right. 30,000 different species. I actually don't because mine got stripped by antibiotics when I was sick a few years ago. But well, most people do, hopefully. No, no, Randy, you haven't let me finish. But we're supposed to have 20 to 30,000 different bacterial species living in our gut. That alone, that's not even counting what's on our skin. Um, but what we have now, it takes 44 people together to come up with 10,000 species among them. So we're running at less than 10% of what we should have in our gut. The gut flora should be 10 times greater in terms of diversity than what it is. And so, Randy, you have plenty of company. But what I'm saying is that interpersonally, we are not used to handling, and we have an instinctive aversion to being around too many different kinds of microbiome. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you an example of how sensitive the body is. I have a friend whose father was a New York City garbage collector his whole life. That's <laughs> My dad was a garbage man. Okay. <laughs> So they live in Queens, and for this man's life, his entire life, he was a New York City sanitation worker. And my friend told me that his father is covered with skin cancers, some of them really severe. And he said, it's because back in the day when my father was a garbage man, they didn't use sunscreen. They didn't know about sunscreen. I said, no, it has nothing to do with that. And he said, well, what, what, what's, what, what is it then? I said, your father was hoisting day after day, hundreds of garbage cans, thousands, containing God knows what, into this truck. This is when they lifted them up by hand. And then the truck, like, mulches it all, you know, compresses it, crushes it. I said, your father's skin was exposed to all these particles, all the this stuff coming off the trash. 
that came from the banana peels and coffee grounds and orange skins. Those might be the good bacterial types. But then there's chemicals, there's containers that are being crushed. So his skin is the largest organ covering his body, and it's the first receiver of all this stuff. That's how sensitive we are. So after a lifetime of do, performing this job, you end up with something like skin cancer, potentially. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So to get into what is happening to the earth, they are stripping the earth of all of its diversity, making it into a monobiome, the soil. And I can explain how that happened. And giving us mono gut. And at the same time, mixing, I mean, there, it's like if you take a palette of paint, you can buy the finest oil paints. You can squeeze them all out onto a painter's palette. And you can have the most amazing colors. You can pay $20 or more for a tube of oil paint. You know, Matter Lake, um, this kind of green, that kind of blue, phthalo blue. You start mixing them together, and what are you going to get? Brown, gray, mud. That's what you get. So nature is about organization. It's about limitations to exposures. It's about keeping things discrete. In biological language, the term discrete, D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E, -E, means separated, distinct, right? And we don't have that anymore. We have a big mishmash, and the mishmash is confusing us. And we're getting too much electricity. We're getting man-made frequencies that don't exist in nature, that are at thousands, billions, um, millions of hertz. And they, they, the industries tell us, oh, don't worry about it. You can't hear these invisible waves. You can't see them. They don't even hurt you. Your body is ignoring all of them. They pass right through. But they're all electrical. And they squeeze our crystals. Every biological cell feels a frequency as a physical, mechanical force. And when you put mechanical force onto crystals, they generate voltages. So we are being electrically manipulated and modulated, over-modulated and over-manipulated on the cellular level by all of this, this motion around us in the form of these invisible waves. So we live in the most chaotic um, circumstances you could probably imagine right now. And the fact that we're alive, I mean, can we be blamed for being dumbed down? flattened out, hardly having any responses or reflexes. This, wow. crystal, this crystalline structure thing is huge. I, I'm, that in itself is an entire conversation. I'm fascinated by the fact that we're basically dealing with the effects of flattening out our piezoelectric structure and... Uh, the term flattening out in itself is so scary. I'm, I'm just kind of riffing through this right now, understanding what crystals do in terms of conduction of energy. And so I'm thinking specifically here, light, light frequencies, and even our own DNA, which, is, which possesses light. I mean, this is all scientific work that's already been done. So in effect, we really are being turned into two-dimensional flat space droid bot beings, aren't we? Right, they want us to be responsive to frequencies and they want to select out um, from among us those hardened people who are so flattened out and they still manage to survive. Look, I've been looking into piezoelectricity more than, any, than I ever did before. And here's a very common example of it. We use piezoelectric transduction. It's called transduction, using transducers. Um, when one form of energy is changed into another. So, Randy, your microphone is taking the sound waves from your voice right. and converting them into electrical signals, which the speakers in my, uh, my equipment, on my end and on Emily's end, are reconverting into waves. So that's what transducers do. They change one form of energy into another. Barbecuing, the spark lighter, what are you doing? You are pressing the switch on your little handy lighter and you are pressing a crystal, a piezoelectric crystal, and the crystal is saying, ow, and it's releasing some voltage, and that's what lights the gas. 
Okay. So all the, what Janice said, and first I did not believe her, but then I started to think about this. She said crystals are, they're intelligent, she said. Mm -hmm. They're living. Yeah. Absolutely. They are a very unique form of matter. And they, when you compress them, when you put voltage on them, this is what ultrasound does. This is what all these different machines do that use transducers. And they're in audio electroacoustic equipment. They're in all kinds of technical equipment. They use crystals and they use metals also do the same thing. You strike a metal with a force and it will release a spark, a voltage. And the voltage could be minute. But the fact is, you're taking materials that are highly sensitive in our bodies and you're exposing them to frequencies that are highly destructive. I mean, our body runs at seven to 12 hertz. It likes waves that are seven to 12 cycles per second. Absolutely, yeah. And the cell phones are one million, two million, Wi-Fi is 2.4 billion hertz. Okay, uh, this, uh, I am, I'm getting flooded with so many thoughts and questions. <laughs> okay, right now. unpack them. Okay, so here we go. So, uh, Everything you just said is totally fascinating. Uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about some of that stuff before, but one of the things that I've been talking about lately, and a lot of people are actually kind of starting to jump into the conversation, is this idea of sugar as programmable matter. And um, sugar also has a crystalline structure, it's cubic. And I'm wondering, listening to what you're saying, is as they flatten out our natural piezoelectric crystals in our body, making us less functional and whatnot is part of the reason that there is an increase, I mean, the, to go along with many other reasons, but there's this, everything has tons and tons and tons of sugar in it. Now people are super addicted to sugar. Is that providing like a temporary, like, cause sugar is a crystalline structure also, like but that is not as good as our natural ones, but is it providing like a quick hit of that sort of energy that we used to get from that or that sort of reaction that we used to get? It also, is it, you know, this increase in the amount of sugar and everything also came along with all of this technology, Wi-Fi, now we have 5G. Like, I'm almost wondering if, like, the, if the, crystalline, uh, form of, uh, the crystalline form that is sugar is somehow intertwined with the 5G, if, those, if like, that, that creates some sort of synergistic reaction in the body or whatever that, that they're looking for. But, um, is, I mean, I don't even know how to ask the question I'm trying to ask. Do you sort of understand what I'm getting at here? Like, are we putting in, like, uh, bad, cheap versions of crystalline structures into our body to sort of achieve false, uh, the, not in any meaningful way, something that used to be natural in our body? Well, sugar, sugar in its manufactured form is a, is a cube. Yeah, it's crystalline structure when you look yeah. at it under a micro, you know, microscope and whatever. Um, Sophia, what do you think about that? Well, again, it's a flood of possibilities, and I have to. I would say, let me stop now. Let me look up some things. But <laughs> you know, sugar is a crystal. Salt is also. Yeah. Um, but sugar, sucrose is what you're talking about. And sucrose, its molecular formula is C12H22O11. Did you think I knew that? Mm -hmm. um, but it is. I'm impressed. And sucrose is one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. And the body has to separate them. But it takes a tremendous amount of energy mm -hmm. to separate those two molecules. The glucose you need for certain... Um, certain um, brain you know, function for one. You require yeah, brain a, function, a lot of... Yeah. Biological yeah. processes. The fructose is not so helpful and it's sent to the liver and treated as fat. And that's what's making a lot of people, it's that banked is. as fat in the body and it's, it's tr has to be processed by the liver. Especially is that fatty liver disease? Uh, yes. Okay. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is often due to the consumption of soda pop, um, too much pastry and carbohydrate, which gets rendered down into the sugar. Well, yeah. now we've got these super sugars, um, the uh, high fructose corn syrups that are, these things are manufactured as distillation process, ex almost exactly like petroleum is refined. So we have this, which is going into the body 
as a highly concentrated form of fructose. And we're already starting to see the numbers come out on the elevated levels of diabetes as a result of, I guess, about a decade now, this product being marketed. So we're now being flooded with, with, a, with a type of sugar that's almost like a fast transit to, to diabetes. Right. But where I was trying to go with this was that it takes so much energy on the processing level, mm -hmm. cellular level, to break sugar down that it ultimately tires you out more than it gives you energy. But in the modern world, sugar and its handiness, the ready availability of refined sugar, sucrose, has been seized by people needing or seeking energy as a source of energy. So there's a movie I put on my blog, it's called Globesity. And it is so sad to watch because the amount of overweight, not in the world population in general, but particularly in third world countries, is horrifying. Now these people, if you can picture the native Indians of South America and people in whatever, uh, underdeveloped countries, not industrialized countries, um, whose resources were obviously screwed around with by invading forces such that the people couldn't really live off the land anymore. And they grew up calorie poor. They needed food. And now companies like Coca-Cola have flooded Brazil and other poor, poor countries. And they've put Coca-Cola machines in the schools. The children cannot get water in the school. They get Coca-Cola. And the parents raising these children took to the availability of these cheap junk calories, as you would find in potato chips, pizza, um, Coke, and other sweet drinks, Fanta, and the various sweet drinks that are marketed in these countries. And they supplied their children with these calories because they had grown up calorie starved. So their bodies were not able to make a distinction between useless calories and useful calories. The other thing that's happened is the rubber sole. And that relates to rubber S-O-U-L also. We are meant to be barefoot, bare-assed on the ground. And from the ground you get free electron transfer, which helps you to make ATP. The cells have these nano batteries in them. You can have up to a million in a cell that are called adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And what the cell does all day long is it pulls electrons out of ATP and uses these electrons to perform its work, whether it's housekeeping, making a new cell, getting rid of junk, detoxing, having your body move, think, whatever, breathe. But what has happened is we have been placed in rubber-soled shoes that are not conductive. They don't take the electrons out of the ground. The Earth's ground has it's all conductive. It's composed of water and earth, which is composed of minerals. So the lightning that strikes the earth some 200 times per second all over the planet is creating a mild electron flow, which has become a life stimulus. Now plants get that, animals get that, but human beings don't get that anymore. 50 years ago, 60, 70, 80 years ago, when children walked to school on dirt roads with their little leather shoes, even when people walked to work in New York City, in their leather-soled shoes on the concrete sidewalks, which are conductive, they would get free electron transfer. They had a much better biome, because I haven't even gotten into the poisoning of the soil, but they were able to conduct their basic biochemistry supplied with free electrons. And what has happened since they put us in leather, in leather shoes that are rubber-soled even, rubber shoes, put us in raised buildings off the ground, taken us away from the negative, the free electrons, the free negative mm. charge of the earth. We have started to degenerate, sicken, lose that sense of having enough energy. We have had to solely take our electrons out of food processing, which is not supposed to be the way to do it, in my opinion. The body wants free electrons. That's why you climbed into that rock crevice and you lay there because you were getting free electron transfer. We just don't get that enough. So this is why people have started to eat 
junk food, carbohydrates and fats, like there's no tomorrow, especially the poor people, because they're wearing these bloody flip-flops. I, I wonder if, I, I, when you were talking about the Sophia, I remembered like when I was little, like in elementary school, it was a trend to wear moccasins, right? But these moccasins were, were not leather soled on the bottom. They had rubber soles. So it was moccasins that had, you know, like rubber soles on the bottom. And then, you know, later when I was a little older, you know, I had trips to places like, you know, Santa Fe and whatever. And I saw, oh, here they, like, you, you can still go to some specialty stores and buy ones that are just leather on the bottom. But like, <laughs> it's, I started to think, okay, so I wonder if like, the uh, bringing of the uh, sugar, like Coca-Cola, and the changing of the diet of people in native communities probably paralleled the putting of rubber on the bottom, on the soles of moccasins, right? Rubber so, on the soles of everything. Minnetonka yeah. is the brand you were Minnetonka, talking Minnetonka, yes. That's it. That's what I had, yeah. When I was in high school, we could get totally leather moccasins with fringes and you had to dip the leather bottoms which were just the same material the tops were made of you dip them in water and they hardened yeah that's how you made the sole a little tougher but then came minnetonka with the little white rubber soles on yeah. all the moccasins and those soles got really nasty looking after a while because they discolored with dirt mm -hmm. but yes that's right they've put the poor people the native people the rubber, synthetic rubber, I have heard that one reason, I mean, this is the synthetic rubber that was made in World War, uh, after World War II changed the whole picture of the earth. Vietnam had natural rubber. That was one reason we had to get into Vietnam for the, all that rubber mm. and for the titanium, for the jet age. Yep. So we have converted many parts of the world into um, this green revolution, agriculture, the boom of agriculture. That's what has poisoned the soil. So yeah. you know, buzz saw, of course. So what I want to get into now is how we lost the biome of the soil. So the soil, the top soil on the earth should be about 200 feet deep, and it isn't anymore, thanks to what we've done. We have built, graded, I mean, the Dust Bowl, the Dust Bowl with those giant storms, that occurred in the 1930s because of the new farming methods, the constant tilling, the uprooting of the prairie grass, which had very deep roots, the conversion of prairie into fields for farming, and then the constant processing of the soil to aerate it, aerate it. So when the storms came, they took up the dust and blew it away, and they rendered that part of America very un workable for, I mean, I've heard that one eighth of the population of California comes from Oklahoma. This is where everybody went, you know, after the Dust Bowl. But the Dust Bowl was created, the loss of topsoil. This is what happened in Spain. Felipe I was advised to cut down all the trees of Spain and make the Spanish Armada and turn Spain into a power, a giant colonial power. And what happened? The rains came and the topsoil washed away, and spraying is no longer agricultural except for citrus and olives. So the whole nature of the world can change just from a few mistakes. And after World War II, with the boom of industry that had been expanded for the war, to win the war, right? Um, they used a lot of fertilizers that were petroleum based on the soil. Plus, they start, they were dumping. Anytime there was a big factory or industry that made something, you know, Alcoa that created aluminum or all the refineries that were being used for wartime. Fluoride. Now we're talking right. about yeah. aluminum and fluoride. Right. So the phosphate industry. Yep. Anyway, and the uranium refinement for fluoride refine is used in refining uranium for the Manhattan Project. But they would dump their waste, their factory waste, which would collect in the chimneys and elsewhere, and they would just dump it on empty land because it's empty. Nobody's there. Nobody's using it. Nobody cares. So then, you know, we developed more of an environmental consciousness. The EPA started to get a little more serious about this. And they were telling these big companies, you can't just do that. You can't just dump stuff. You have to... Label it hazardous waste, you have to contain it safely, you have to 
put it on a train or a truck and put it somewhere and dispose of it in a safe manner so that it doesn't reach biological life. All right, that cost a lot of money. Somebody had a brainwave. And the brainwave was this. It was, hey, what is in the baghouse dust, the flue dust, the chimney debris that we scrape out on a periodic basis? Well, it's lead, arsenic, manganese, barium, strontium, aluminum. Guess what, everybody? Just look at the periodic table. These are earth elements. They're in the earth. What's the big deal? So if they are in the earth, of course, in micro minute quantities, let's just put them back in the earth. This is where they belong. Let's just give them to the farmers, mix it with fertilizer, give it to the farmers and have them sprinkle it back on the fields. And that's what they did. So organic is a bit of a misnomer. Organic means no chemi chemical pesticides used, but doesn't mean no chemical fertilizers. And I spent some years at a farmer's market and I was speaking to farmers and hearing what they said to people, and the organic farmers were letting people know that as an organic farmer, you can put up to 250 chemicals on your crops as fertilizer. So Americans have been deluded into thinking that organic food is safe when it really isn't. So here's what happened. When they started using chemical fertilizers with all these nice little factory remains in them, they killed the biome in the soil. Bacteria and fungi do not thrive in harsh chemical environments. They injured the crops. And what biology does is if you insult it, if you injure it, it will respond with a growth spurt. So it looked like these chemical fertilizers were assisting crops to grow, but they really weren't because over time they were weakening the crops. Each generation of the crop got less and less vital and strong and nourishing. The soil had, it depleted the soil of the biome. So it created a monobiome in the soil. And the result was that, um, the wheat crops do, uh, drew the pests. So now you could make chemical pesticides. Wow. So now you had a twin industry. And between the chemical fertilizers and the chemical pesticides, our, the food we eat does not have the biome necessary to support our health. Because in your gut and in the air, the air you breathe is another way of transferring biome. In your gut are these supposedly tens of thousands of bacterial species, and they signal, bacteria are not human. So what is fascinating about this is that way back when, when we complexified, however we started, we started as some kind of living organism, and then we integrated another life form into our bodies. We integrated prokaryotes. We are eukaryotes. Our cells have cell walls within them. The nucleus is contained by a cell membrane as is the outside of the cell by the what's called the cytoplasmic membrane. But in prokaryotes, bacteria, they don't have that nucleus that's surrounded by its own membrane. Prokaryotes make their energy in a different way. They make their energy outside their bodies. We make our energy inside our bodies. And guess what? All the food you eat, you can't process it. You can prepare it, you, it looks good, it tastes good, you swallow it, but once it's in your gut, you can't do a damn thing with it. It's up to the bacteria that live in your gut to liberate the sugars and fats from the food you eat. They are the ones that do it. It's another life form. So as we complexify, we brought in a whole other life form that does our digestion for us. It's just like Exxon or Chevron. They bring in workers. Each department has a different task. So we integrated, incorporated bacterial forms to the tune of millions and millions of different kinds that live in our gut and digest our food for us. Then the wall of the gut, the membrane, now the gut membrane, picture your gut, all your intestines, all the different organs that do the digestion and whatnot. If you took the membrane that shields and contains the gut flora, the gut biome, and you spread it out, it would be the size of two tennis courts. That's how big it is, and it's one cell thick, but that's an intelligent membrane. So 
as your bacteria inside you start processing your food, the membrane says, hey, I know now I should open up. So the cells in it open up just a little bit and they let the digested material slip out into the waiting blood vessels. That membrane has to function intelligently. It's controlled by what's called tight junctions. I know there's a lot of information. But as soon as you get chemicals in your body, as soon as you breathe in glyphosate, you might not eat GMO foods but or foods that have any kind of chemical herbicide or pesticide or whatnot on them. But when you go out into the world, 70% of the air has glyphosate in it, the rainfall. There were something like, I think, 200 million kilos of glyphosate sold last year, and only 1% ever killed a weed. The rest of it is airborne, right? Yeah. So it's off patent now. 2007, it went off patent, which means that Seven giant companies are making glyphosate now, and it's marketed to everybody. Home Depot's, the shelves are full of it, Roundup. So Roundup opens up your gut membrane. The second you breathe it, your gut membrane, you produce a protein called zonulin in response, and that opens up your gut membrane. And then all these half-processed things that you're trying to digest fully and make them safe to be in the blood, to be given to the cells, they leak out. Bacteria leak out. This is how we are getting autoimmune disease and a lot of dysfunction in our health because stuff is leaking out of our leaky gut wall. So whether people think they have leaky gut or not, in the modern world, they do because the soil has lost its biome and the bacteria that are in our gut are so limited and the chemicals are so opening up our gut wall that we have leaky gut and leaky gut, according to Dr. Zach Bush from who's interviews, I really learned this, is the basis for all health failure. Yeah. Okay. Now, wow. So that was, that, was, that was a lot of stuff that was fascinating. A couple things I want to remark on. The interesting thing you said about what was naturally in the ground and then what they decided they could just dump more back into it. So a lot of those elements are also the same things that we found in the chemtrails. So that's interesting. So, right, like the barium, the strontium, manganese, things like that. These are things that have all been sprayed at one time too. So I find that interesting. So that's just dumping of more and further insulting. Uh, I just thought it was interesting. It was the same elements. And then, um, yeah, you just led us through a whole bunch of other stuff uh, with the gut biome um, and the glyphosate and the leaky gut syndrome. Um, the leaky gut is really interesting. And that actually leads into the next kind of, the sort of next area I wanted to go into, but I wanted to make sure, Randy, did you have any questions about what Sophia said or Sophia, did you have anything further to say on that? And also, um, yeah. Not at this time, no. Nope. Well, here's another fascinating thing. Now I'm going to shoot a little uh, spear into my thesis, which okay. will provoke Emily and light her all up. So, <laughs> I don't know you as well, Randy, so that's why I'm not including you in some of my predictions here. <laughs> but, okay, so, like I said, the work of Lynn Margulis, she was an evolutionary biologist, the wife of Carl Sagan, and she theorized in her writings that we have integrated, incorporated these other life forms. She calls them endosymbionts. They are necessary for our existence. Endo meaning inside, symbionts meaning like symbiosis, other things that work in, in tandem with you and your functions. So we complexify not by conquering other life forms, she says, but by including them. And thus we became, our energy needs, you have to understand, human beings, here I am, I'm sitting at my computer, I'm gesticulating, Randy is chewing something, pondering, flipping his head from side to side, his brain is going, Emily is smiling and concentrating and thinking of questions, and her brain is firing, and later today you're going to do all kinds of other very complex tasks. Our energy needs are huge, huge. In fact, your cellular ATP all those electrons that you suck out of ATP in all your cells, you, ATP then is reduced to its precursors, adenosine, monophosphate, and diphosphate. And the job of the mitochondria in your cells, those are these little intelligent organisms that live in your cells, and guess what? They are not human. 
the bacteria in your stomach, your gut, are not human, and the mitochondria in your cells are not human. So we've integrated once again. Yeah. They are derived from ancient bacteria, and guess what they do, the mitochondria? They are the brains of the cell. Not only do they make us ATP, thank you, they have to go find electrons to put into the ATP to reconstitute it. You turn over every day, you reconstitute your body weight in ATP. If you didn't have mitochondria making ATP properly, you wouldn't live for more than a few seconds. And your body weight, that's how much ATP you use every day. So the mitochondria, another life form in our cells, is making the ATP. And guess what? The bacteria in our gut speak a signaling language. It's called redox signaling to the mitochondria. There's a conversation that goes on back and forth, back and forth. You have thousands of different kinds of cells, and that's why you need thousands of different kinds of bacteria in your gut, because they each speak to certain kinds of cells. The diversity links up with the diversity of your cellular systems. And the bacteria in your gut, they make a metabolite. I call it a motorcycle sidecar. They make their own energy in the form of a carbon molecule, a metabolite. It's a different kind of carbon from the usual carbon. And each type of bacteria that's supposed to live in your gut makes a different kind of carbon motorcycle sidecar. And it's these carbon molecules that have binding sites that match up electrically with the binding sites on the mitochondria of your cells. And they speak directly. So if you don't have a certain type of bacteria in your gut, you are prone to a certain type of cancer. Because the mitochondria are the little critters in each cell that tell the cell, you have to die now. You are going to get cancer otherwise. You're a little too sick for your own good. A normal cell in the human body is allowed to subdivide. That's how we replicate cells. They subdivide 70 times, seven zero. And after that, the cell is retired. It's too old. It has to go. It has to die. So that self-death is called apoptosis. And it's the mitochondria that give the cell the signal to retire. Go to bed now forever. And when you don't have the right carbons in your gut, the mitochondria are not getting the right signals, and they're not letting the cell die. And a cancerous cell is a cell that, now here's where Emily will light up again, a cell that is so weak and so sick that it goes into a tremendous defense mode. It shields itself with a very thick protein that's very hard to break down, um, and it stops making energy in the nucleus. The mitochondria are too tired now. They can't make the ATP for the cell. And the cell has a throwback that is called glycolysis. And it uses fermentation in the cytoplasm using enzymes upon sugar, upon glucose, mm -hmm. for its energy. Yes. So when people become tired on the cellular level and they have too many cells converting from what's called aerobic respiration, the phosphorylation, the oxygen energy making cycle, those cells revert back to using glucose, making the energy in the cytoplasm. They don't have a long life. And a glycolytic cell that is in a continual reproduction mode, it's, in a, it's psycho, it wants to reproduce, 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 because it's dying, that's cancer. Okay. Oh boy. So we have this situation where the uh, breakdown of the soil and the, the resulting um, reduction in the amount of the necessary flora bacteria in our gut has created a situation where uh, because there's not enough bacteria there or there's a limited variety not the full amount of communication that needs to happen in the body for pro cellular processes and other things to happen correctly can happen. And when, so, so when cells don't know when to die off, they do, they start to protect themselves. And uh, they, when they're sort of out of ever, anything else, they begin to sort of pickle themselves in order to uh, create what's necessary for them to continue living. 
Right. They become okay. fermentation based. Ferment energy, yes. Okay. And they make energy out of glucose in yes. the cytoplasm, no longer in the nucleus. And they continue to subdivide because they're feverishly trying to stay alive, keep their okay. line alive. They're called an infinite cell line. That's what cancer is. Okay. So, okay. So, Randy, do you have anything you want to ask before I kind of go where I want to go with this? Nope, I don't. Okay. All right. So that, Sophia, you just gave me the perfect gift to, to send me into that next area I wanted to go into. And, you know, what you've been talking about lines itself up really well with this whole issue that of um, candida, the problem of candida in the body. And it's been something I've been talking about quite a bit lately, and I've been getting tons and tons of questions about it. And, you know, candida basically occurs happens is candida is a yeast that is ubiquitous it's on it's on your skin it's in your body and at the proper balance it's it's necessary and not harmful um but what happens is when this reduction or the stripping or the elimination of the necessary uh flora fauna gut bacteria all that kind of stuff happens the yeast begins to overgrow Okay, so the yeast overgrows and sort of flowers into a fungus kind of thing, which that fungus, and this relates to what you were talking about with the gut membrane, that fungus begins to poke holes in the gut lining or the gut membrane, and that allows, uh, per the perforation allows parasites to come into the, to, to, you know, the, come into the body and then basically Put, put themselves right into the, you know, through the stomach lining, through the stomach wall, and begin to sort of take over in our body. And the, you know, sugar feeds yeast, right? So sugar is, you know, once things are at, it's, when the body's in balance, it seems to be able to handle a particular level of sugar. Um, and I'm speaking, you know, I'm not an expert on this. I've learned a lot from my own experience. I recommend people read The Candida Cure by Anne Baroque. I'll discuss that another time, maybe more in more depth. But, um, you know, basically what happens is the, you know, when you, you've been stri stripped from too much, uh, too many antibiotics, like Randy said, or um, yeah, steroid use or something like that for when you're, when you're a kid, not steroid use for muscles, but for, you know, for health problems or a stressful lifestyle or unhealthy diet for too long or a number of other things, or even just what Sophia is talking about by the fact that we're not getting from our soil and our, therefore our food, the level of bacteria that we need to keep the stomach running as it should. And the, therefore the body yeast will overgrow and it will start to take over and turn into this fungus, and then you have parasites and whatnot, and all of this functions on sugar, because sugar feeds yeast, yeast creates the fungus, and it's an ongoing cycle. One of the things that's been, seems to have been offered by people, or whatever, that are as a solution, or as part of what is good for clearing the body of candida, are fermented foods and kombucha. In fact, there are even people, there's even, uh, you know, groups and websites that are suggesting that that be the main component of clearing your body for, from, of candida. And um, when I went to see Anne, I asked, you know, about when I was her client, I asked her about that. And she said, no, no fermented foods, certainly not for the first 90 days of the diet, no fermented foods. And kombucha, no, not ever. And what she explained to me basically was a couple of things. First of all, that those things create histamine in the, in the body, which is involved with inflammation and some other problems. But also, you know, that, that particularly with kombucha is that there is bacteria in there. They're offering these things because they're saying fermented foods and kombucha have the good bacteria or probiotic in them, right? All of a sudden we need all this probiotic and all this bacteria. We never heard these terms as things we needed until, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, but Obviously, you know, with the, with the depletion of soil and whatnot, this would be an obvious. But there are, you know, so they're saying that they offer those things, but particularly in the case of kombucha, from what I understand, that there is also sugar and yeast there, right? And so candida is a situation that has arisen because we're lacking gut bacteria, but it's thriving based on sugar feeding yeast. So why you would want to take something into your body at the, at, particularly while trying to clear the body of that, that is just going to create more of it and feed more of that, doesn't really make any sense. 
when I stopped drinking the kombucha, I immediately felt better. And so intuitively, I understood, even though I didn't and still completely don't understand technically why it's important not to, to drink that, uh, you know, I, I felt better. And so, okay, that works for me. I speak with a lot of people who um, insist on drinking kombucha and eating a lot of fermented foods. And other than those things, they may be eating a very similar diet to what I'm eating, but they still don't feel good and I do. So my instinct was like, okay, like, that's it. Like it's no to those things. Um, but what I started to notice is over the last couple of years, especially like certainly it's probably been going on for 10 years, but it's really ramped up in the last few years. If you go into any health food store or even any regular grocery store at this point, some grocery stores I go to have an entire aisle dedicated to kombucha or an entire aisle dedicated to fermented foods. It is being pushed and marketed at a rate that is phenomenal. And some of these kombuchas are loaded with sugar. In addition to the fact that sugar can be created by the same pickling process that, uh, or fermentation process that Sophia has described that occurs inside the body. Same thing can happen in that bottle of kombucha. There's definitely you know, sugar and yeast growth component to host that, some of that bacteria, or to hold, if I understand correctly, that bacteria that people supposedly say is good. So. Is it good to have all this icky stuff just to get a little bit of something good? But also, why is this being marketed so heavily? Like, you know, a lot of them have a lot of sugar in them. And, you know, uh, people are, some people drink two or three bottles of kombucha a day. I see people who eat pickled and fermented foods every day. Anne said that after you've sort of cleared your body of candida, it's okay to have fermented foods occasionally a little bit. They don't seem to have the same problem with yeast that the kombucha does. And again, I don't know that I'm getting all of this exactly right. I recommend people read her book to understand further. But my concern came as I started to kind of put together that the kombucha and fermented food fad phase seemed to parallel the rise of, not necessarily the rise of candida, I think that's something that's always existed. And she would say, as you would say, this whole leaky gut is the basis of all the health problems in the body. She would say that candida is the basis of all the health problems in the body, but most people who have leaky gut have candida. So those two things are related. And she basically would say you know, it is the cause. It creates the environment in the body that allows um, disease to thrive, which is essentially the same thing you said about the cancer cell. Okay, I also noticed that this, this it was the same period of time that Morgellons started to really thrive in. And I'm wondering, and I noticed I had some issues with Morgellons that disappeared at, as I cleaned my body from, with the, you know, as I cleaned my body with can candida and corrected my diet. I'm wondering if the same environment that makes candida and autoimmune disease thrive and whatever also is the one that makes Morgellons thrive. And is there, you know, is there some sort of intentional push here for people to have that environment in their body? as we move towards a situation where, you know, more and more things are coming at us through the bad food we eat, through the things they spray in the sky, and those things possibly having nanotechnology implications. Um, are they wanting our bodies to be sort of, uh, I don't even know what the word is, like, uh, uh, I don't even know what the word is, but like to have this sort of soup inside of us that lets all of these things fester and flower and grow to turn us into, you know, something, you know, different than what we were meant to be and not only make us unhealthy, but, you know, what we were talking about earlier, becoming, you know, android-like or becoming, um, you know, just a human and not a human being. Um, I hope I did a decent job unpacking some of that. I'd love to hear your thoughts, both of you. All right, so I want to throw a piece at you that you might not know, which I learned from Dr. Jennifer Daniels, who's written also. Um, yeah, I know her, yeah. On Candida um, control. So Candida are an organism that feeds on dying cells. And dying cells, as I've discussed, when the mitochondria are tanked out and they cannot do oxygen phosphorylation and make your ATP through oxygen in the nucleus, the cell will become glucose feeding from the cytoplasm. So it is a sugar feeding cell. And cells will die if they're too weak or they'll turn cancerous. They'll become, they'll have sudden death, which is necrosis. They'll become diseased. That's another option. There are three options for a cell that's sickly or weak. 
to become diseased, to become dead suddenly, or to go into a spiral toward death in, an, in a fervent attempt, a psycho attempt to stay alive by reproducing ad infinitum, and that's cancer, that's the tumor. So yeast love dying cells, because dying cells are sugar feeding, and so are they, right? Yeah. Yep. You have yeast overgrowth, as they call it, in your body, because detritivores, which are the class, the term that I call bacteria and fungi, they are the trash men of our bodies. You have a process when you have cellular damage or injury called chemotaxis. Chemotaxis involves inflammation. It's part of the inflammatory response. And it is effectively a lineup of what I call soldier cells who come along and they release enzymes, they eat organic detritus, and then another line of different cells, like you have um, um, eosinophils, neutrophils, I don't know what the four names are, but macrophages come at the end. Those are three of the four mm -hmm. names. And each line of new soldier type, like the new cavalry, will also eat up the soldiers that were there before it. So it's a very tidy, very effective cleanup process. But if you don't support the body with proper nutrients, with a good gut biome, which I'll explain in a minute why that's even more important than we think already. If you don't give it light, sunlight, and your body doesn't make vitamin D, which is responsible for hundreds, if not thousands, of biochemical functions to kick them off, and you don't get good air, good water, good rest, and your body is being bombarded by microwaves from your stupid Wi-Fi or your cell phone or the cell tower near you, there's no way you can do your rebuilding properly. So then the rate of cell death outpaces or exceeds the rate of cell repair. And that's when the yeast go, good, you can't clean up the mess, I'll clean it up. So yeast feed on dying cells. Dying cells are sugar feeding, yeast are sugar feeding. And when we lack cellular energy, when we are tanked out on the level of the mitochondria, the mitochondria are starting to wane. We reach for sugary foods. This is the industry in our lives. It says, here, you need a pickup? Take this. K kombucha is probably the new replacement for Coke for a lot of these people. Yep. Right? Yep. And we have a probiotics industry. This is, I think it's something like a $30 billion industry. Do you know what that's for? You know where probiotics come from? Cow's intestines. It doesn't help humans. Yeah, I don't take it. Yeah. It works a little bit because it brings more variation into your mono gut. But over time, all you're getting, most of these probiotics have five to seven strains of some bacteria form that comes from a cow. Some of them, the good ones, have 14, 16 strains. But what are you paying for? It's not going to do anything for you because, again, the metabolites that we need as human beings the carbons that the bacteria, remember the motorcycle sidecars that talk to R30,000 yeah. kinds of specialized cells? That signaling that keeps our mitochondria healthy, we need the bacteria for us, not from cows. Yeah. I, that, that, it's making me think, it is so weird how like we drink cow's milk, they want to give us a probiotic from cows. Um, makes me think of a mad cow disease, right? Like, what is the, I, I'm not even going to tell you where my mind is going right now. But um, why do you think, so this push, is this push for the probiotic, is this like a false replacement for the gut bacteria that we no longer have? It, it's just like a, like a, you know. Yes, yes. It's, yeah. a, it's a false playground. What? Okay, so Dr. Zachary Bush was a chemotherapy researcher funded by the NIH, working at University of Virginia. His funding was cut. He didn't know what to do, so he went back to being a regular doctor in rural Virginia, and it was through this process of trying to get people healthy. The people that he treated, they didn't even have a grocery store. They were so poor in such a remote part of Virginia, they ate from gas stations, vending machines. And convenience foods like crazy. And those people he discovered were not getting healthy even when they ate organic food. And he traced this to the reduction of bacterial diversity in the soil. Mm -hmm. And his brainwave 
was this, and it's truly a brainwave. He went to the desert. Now, I told you that we don't have 200 feet of topsoil anymore. We have two feet of topsoil on this planet, if we're lucky. There's a place in America that's really very conscientiously tried to rebuild topsoil, and they have about eight feet. But we are missing tons of topsoil from the way that we've treated the earth, from building, from the ways we farm, the heavy-duty machinery and modern farming, and then the application of chemicals that kill the biome. So our soil is useless. It contains too many chemical residues, too much glyphosate, which is floating everywhere. So Bush, uh, Zach Bush, Dr. Zach Bush, went to the American Southwest to the desert. And his company, which he's formed now, excavated desert soil, which is compressed, desicate, desiccated topsoil, right? But one time that was perhaps 200 feet of topsoil. Now it's compressed, it's very dried, it's just earth, it's not soil. But guess what? The bacteria are gone from it. The, the 30,000 or 50,000 different kinds of bacteria that should, should be in our soil, they can't live in the desert soil. It's too hot and it's too dry. But guess what remains in the soil? the carbon metabolites that they once created. This is effectively ancient soil. And they have bottled the extract in liquid form from this ancient soil. It's called Restore. I have sold it all summer long at my website, avatarproducts.com. I've also created another website where you can buy it one click, and that is survivalmodestore.com. And once you start taking Restore, you take a teaspoon before each meal, it clicks your health back together. You can feel it. The first thing you feel, Emily, and I've heard this from so many people now, Emily and Randy, is tremendously elevated mood. You become happy. And why is that? Because your body is arranging itself on the cellular level. Now that redox signaling is taking place, those ancient carbon molecules are talking to your different mitochondria and telling them, hey, you need an uptick of this, you need a downtick of that. And everything starts coming together. Restore closes up your gut wall. It makes it intelligent again. Intelligent. So this particular is not a supplement necessarily. It is an, a reorganizer of your gut. It's a replenisher of the missing carbons. And the second thing it does is it gives you incredibly deep sleep. The well-being, the deep sleep, the eradication of gut issues is one of the very instant things. I shouldn't say instant because it's different for everybody. But I would highly recommend that people who have followed this show this far and have whose interest we have evoked in these various topics, particularly the destruction of the soil and what's in our gut, to try this restore. So I have sold it. Um, I have absolutely, I stand behind it. I can't believe it. I think it's a stroke of genius. It is not network marketing or anything like that. I think, I think this also, I mean, um, far be it for me to tell anybody what to do, but I think what the, the product you're talking about and is, uh, the perfect complement for someone who's trying to clear their body of candida and regain their health to, you know, what, what is the point of cleaning it if you're just going to leave the gut unprotected anyway? You know what I mean? So um, I think it actually is a perfect, um, you know, I, it, it sounds like it could, you know, it could be an interesting uh, thing to add for somebody, particularly who is eating, uh, trying to regain their health by eating a healthy diet, but also for people who don't really want to do that, it certainly could probably help them as well. It's been really good for autistic children. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has a brain damaged son who said that since he's put his son on Restore, his son is able to understand things a lot better. He doesn't need instructions given to him over and over, all the repetition. Another friend said that her little uh, toddler, his behavior has totally changed. And the thing is, you know, when you have leaky gut, and leak and a failing digestion. Dr. Bush says all disease starts at the level of the gut. He says yeah. asthma is not a disease of the lungs. It's a disease of the gut expressed in and by the lungs. So
So all disease originates in failure of the gut. And I would say it's because you don't have enough of those different carbons talking electrically to the different kinds of mitochondria. If you're only running at less than 10,000 carbon variants, bacterial variants, you are going to not have enough language going on to all, with all your different cells. You have many kinds of brain cells, many kinds of blood cells, many kinds of skin cells. I mean, just think about it, right? Yeah. Bone so cells, all different kinds. And they all speak a different language, and you have to have the bacteria that make the carbons that speak all those different languages. It's kind of like if, when you, if, you, if, in a, if in a particular language you don't have a word for some kind of idea or experience, then that, in that culture it doesn't exist. So if your body doesn't have the necessary language to do something, it can't, it can't, it's not aware that that function needs to be performed. So by restoring this, you're giving it the language to enable it to have the experience or perform the function. Right, and it's an electrical language. Now, you've heard, everybody talks about this. Oh, well, my grandfather, you know, he smoked every day and they ate hot dogs or whatever. They <laughs> did a standard American diet and he lived till he was 95. Why? Why? Because he had, he started life out with a good gut biome. He didn't start out with leaky gut. He might have ended up with it. Okay. But the fortification, the fortitude of the body to start with. Why do you think children run around and scream and jump every day, all day long? Because they have, they're, they're young, they're green, they have that mitochondrial resilience. And as we get older and older, and we start failing on the level of the gut, everything starts getting more and more tired. It just starts dragging. And one thing Restore does is it gives you phenomenally high levels of energy and happiness. You cannot buy happiness. You can go to a therapist, but it's probably gonna make you more unhappy, right? <laughs> so I have found this to be quite revolutionary and I could not wait to try it. And I put a bunch of friends on it and then I decided I've gotta get it. And I've put up another store where I'm selling my best selling products from my avatarproducts.com website is survivalmodestore.com. Those are the best sellers and restore is there. Randy. Randy. Sorry. I was muted out. So you got my attention on the restore. I was just looking on the website at this. It looks like, uh, there's also a sinus spray as well. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? The sinus spray, as I understand it, is um, a small bottle that is created to be sprayed up in the nose. And it is simply the re liquid Restore. Let me describe Restore. Restore looks like weak Lipton tea, and it tastes just like that. It's almost tasteless. Some people say it's a little bit bitter, like, you know, if you drank Lipton tea weak, iced tea without sugar, that's how it would taste. And um, the sinus spray is simply a dilution with distilled water of the liquid restore. And when you hydrate your tissues with it in your nose, it immediately starts to quell allergic types of symptoms. It starts closing the, the wall. The gut membrane is in your nose. It's in your sinus cavity. And so... The why, and that's the reason why I ask you about this is because I suffer from issues related to my sinus cavity, my, my, my ears, no, ears, nose, and throat. This is like a lifetime thing for me. But it also seems to cascade into my digestive tract as well. That's why I was looking at that. And when I saw it, it got my attention. Well, you're describing gut failure in the level of your head in those passages. And then it's trickling down. You have probably got gut wall weakness just like everybody does, but the it's exacerbated in those tissues in your um, head and throat. So restore might be something you would like to try. And one thing that I've learned from so many webinars and seminars that I've listened to Dr. Bush talking on, um, especially with this health practitioner uh, community, they say that for every year of your life, that you have had a diagnosis of something or had um, something going on, you need to be taking Restore for a month 
to, and so let's say you've had something for 10 yeah, years. I've actually heard this formula before in another context. That's interesting. Oh, you have? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that, and I'm just repeating what I've heard. That, But in that time, so if you've had something for 10 years, you restore for 10 months, see what happens at the end. You might actually feel... I know where I heard it, actually, just to drop this in for a long time, listeners. Dr. Shamil Asher talks about this when people give up eating meat, that effectively... There's a healing process, a restoration process that occurs over a fractional period of time relative to the time that you've eaten meat. Right. I'm sure that's probably common with a lot of different therapies. But mm -hmm. once again, none of this is medical advice. I'm not right, a doctor. Right. I'm just telling you what I've experienced, what friends of mine have experienced. There's a tremendous community that um, loves Restore, and there's a dropout rate, too. There are people who don't take it properly and... Here's one thing. You might start with just a drop or two. The more sensitive you are, the more important it is to take Restore in small quantities because it's strong. It will work on your body in a strong way. Well, we're going to find out because I have the website up right now. I'm getting ready to order. That's how motivated <laughs> I am right now. Andy, I would hope you would order it from me. Rather That's than, where I'm, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. yes, everybody Everybody who's interested in our store, please order from Sophia. Avatarproducts.com is the website, is that correct? Yeah. 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 And, yeah or survivalmodestore.com. You can get it there, too. And here's the deal. I have a bulk deal for Restore. Once, I mean, the sad thing is you got to keep taking it. But here's what happens. If you start improving in terms of your symptoms, and I'm not going to say this is a cure because nobody is allowed to say that. Because nope. The yeah. Yeah. nope. Not allowed but, to say cure. But if your symptoms improve, I'll tell you what it's done for me. I had a damaged eardrum for 10 years, okay? And I didn't know what it was from. I found out eventually as I learned more about these wireless technologies that I, when in the, remember when the cordless phone came out and you could walk all over the house and you had your head crooked with a stupid phone stuck on your shoulder and yeah. you everything, talking on the phone, you could talk out on the deck, you can talk in any room. So I was using my 900 megahertz cordless phone constantly. And I noticed eventually within a year or so that I had this fluttering in my right ear, which was my phone ear. And I thought, there's something wrong with my eardrum. It's tympanic membrane. It's like quivering, fluttering. You're talking but, about me. This is it, exactly it, what I'm going Right. It feels like there's a moth in your head. Yes, yes. And it keeps you up at night. And, you know, it's in, it was intermittent. Sometimes it would go away for a little while. And then it... So, I did not know what to do. And then I realized it's damage from the wireless frequencies that went right into my ear and head. And God knows what it did to my brain. So I figured I was stuck with it. I don't use those phones anymore. I don't have anything wireless, but I still had the vibration, the rattling, the fluttering. Guess what? Two months on Restore, it's gone. Along with several other things that I did not even realize were gone until they were gone. And I was floored, floored. And that has to do with the corrective electrical signaling from those lignite metabolites, mm -hmm. carbon. Mm -hmm. Talking to the carbons in the cells of my eardrum, sorry, not the carbons, the mitochondria, telling them the carbons from the restore are talking to the mitochondria in my eardrum, telling them how to start getting back into better shape. There you go. And this is what happened to me. I don't have that anymore, Randy. It is gone. This is awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I, I, I do want to say here that, like, I don't, I know Sophia well enough to, to know that she, um, she definitely takes good care of her body and eats a healthy yep. diet. Yep. Yeah, you know, uh, for people out there who want to experiment with, with something like Restore, um, I would say that, uh, Making changes in diet and health and lifestyle are crucial whether you want to or not, but certainly will amplify the effects of any kind of product. When your body is in good condition and then you put something in it that, that, that is good for it, it will respond to it you know, in, in a more magnified way than it will if it's you know, coming from uh, you know, a further place of, of you know, depletion. Um, so with all of these things, I also recommend, and each person has to decide for themselves what healthy diet and lifestyle is. Um, but you know, I think that's a, 
that's a, that should be a given with this stuff as well. Right. And I have found with both iodine, restore, magnesium, grounding or earthing, that the best candidates who report the fastest um, benefits, the benefits that occur the fastest, are those who are already taking good care of themselves. The people who are in gross biological dysregulation, disarray, who don't eat properly, who don't get the right rest, who never go outdoors. I mean, someday we might do a show on this biological darkness. If you work inside and you don't look at the blue sky at least to get that light into your eyes, which is also electron donating, you will end up in a state. You will have no, you will have insufficient vitamin D being made by your body, which does not kick off sufficient numbers of biochemical reactions, transactions, functions, and you will end up living, now this is bone chilling, in a state that is called biological darkness. It will be as though it were dark all day long, every day. This is what happens when you work inside. What they've done with these lights, light has to be, in order for it to be biologically viable and a trigger for biological functionality, light has to have a a yellow cast to it, like the sun, like firelight, and it has to have a thermal component, heat. So incandescent bulbs are yellow and hot. Even halogens are. But these new bulbs that they're giving us, they are blue. They are the light of the night. Yeah. We have well, what the LEDs. Blue light, in my opinion, blue light carries uh, information in a different way that is not necessarily good for the human body or mind or anything. You know what I mean? It's absolutely. Right. You want to have proper daylight that has a heat component. And what are chemtrails doing? Chemtrails are putting a white haze up over exactly. yeah. the blue sky, and they are turning the frequencies of daylight into the frequencies of moonlight yeah we are promoting what i call the sepsis agenda yeah you had um you had a fast i mean i think you've probably spoken out with a couple people but you had a really good show with greg carlwood about that like a while back i remember maybe we'll talk, get into that further sometime i just wanted to ask you because you brought these up as things that are important for someone to do take good care of their body what um if you don't mind if you don't mind my asking two things what kind of grounding techniques do you use? Because in our personal conversations, you've mentioned that quite a bit. And I've experimented with some things a little bit, and I know it's something that, that I need to work on because um, I can get carried, a, get carried away pretty quickly. And grounding is important for me. What kind of grounding techniques, or even I know there are even some grounding kinds of products. What kind of grounding techniques do you use, Sophia? I had a friend who designed a grounding system that he very generously told me about and allowed me to develop further, and I don't sell it online because it requires too much hand-holding and coaching. I will sell it privately. It's not expensive. It's the most lightweight, portable, effective grounding that money can buy. And anyone who's interested in it is welcome to email me at avatarproducts.com, and I will engage in a discussion and explain what it is. But it just, here's the deal. If you Grounding means you put your feet in contact with the earth and you get that free electron transfer. Since we've been taken off the ground, as I discussed earlier in the show by our modern lifestyles, we have lost contact with the earth and we have reverted to donatable electrons coming for, from the processing of our food, the breakdown of our food. That's the job of the bacteria. But if you get free electrons, for instance, when you go to the beach, and you spend the day, you know, running through the waves and walking barefoot on the sand and rolling in the sand and whatever you do, you are drinking in millions of electrons and they're going into a gel-like substance in your body that I believe is very ancient. It yep. is not fibrous. So we are fibrous beings. Everything in us, all of our organogenesis uh, is tubular. And that's why Morgellons is a big deal, because Morgellons operates with fibers. So it's a synthetic biology that's being superimposed on our natural biology in yeah. the fiber creation, which then spins into more and more organs. So Mark Krasno is a biochemist at Stanford who came up with this tubular 
basic structure to all of life. The heart, I just watched a video, I put it on my blog. The heart, it's a big long tube that's curled, yeah. curled, curled. You know those, like those rope um, baskets yeah. and bowls that they make yeah. in different kinds of cultures. The heart is a big tube, it's all coiled on itself. So anyway, I found this all fascinating. And I worked out on my own that the missing free electron transfer is largely responsible for our failing mitochondria, our lack of energy, our lack of ATP. And when you go to the beach, you bring home the electrons. They're banked in this gel in your body that's called ground substance. And then all night long, your body uses those electrons to refurbish your cells, to rebuild, regenerate, clean up, detoxify. So when you miss electrons, this free electron transfer every day, you are gonna end up with, your health is gonna, you be holding the short end of the stick. Yeah. So what modern um, electricity has done, the codes, for us, they, modern life took us off the ground, but since the 70s or 80s, 80s in particular, they introduced the three hole wall outlet. So we now have wall outlets with a ground hole. And if you can connect to the ground hole, that round hole at the bottom of your wall outlet with a brass pin and you um, put a wire on it, and you put it on against your body, the other end of that wire, you're not getting any current because there's no electricity. That ground hole just goes down to the ground rod under your house. You're literally drinking electrons in from the bottom of your house, from the earth, because wow. your ground rod is several feet long and it's plunged deep into the earth. So it's being grounded indoors means you sleep grounded, you they have grounding mats and such, but those things are cumbersome and expensive. And the thing that I have is a lot simpler, a lot easier to use. But as I said, people whose biology is in disarray, people who are careless with their health, they don't even feel the effects of grounding. I have noticed that a lot of people who have Wi-Fi and use cell phones a lot, they'll tell you the grounding thing just doesn't even work and they'll return it. And the fact is it's working. But they are not feeling it because they have this constant yeah. jarring, this constant disharmony going on. Now, I'm going to give you one, um, one quick thing here. Your red blood cells are, they should be in a liquid form like red wine. They should not be sludgy like ketchup. So you expose yourself to cellular radiation from your phone. And within a few minutes, Magda Havas on YouTube does a demonstration of this. Within just a few minutes of being exposed to a cell phone, your red blood cells are lining up like a stack of coins. It's called rouleau formation, rouleau. And they are all stuck together. Now, when you have blood that sticks together, sticky blood, viscous blood, this gives you much higher risk for stroke. It gives you very poor circulation. Your blood isn't moving as fast. Um, I, once you start grounding, your blood liquefies again. It becomes the consistency that it should be. And that can be within an hour. Wow. That's very interesting. I, I'm, I may contact you about one of those. I agree with you about the Wi-Fi. I've been, um, for the past month or so, um, I've taken to experience to turning the Wi-Fi off, turn, unplugging the router um, before I go to bed. And that seems to have helped me with sleep a little bit but yeah I, it's very interesting what you say about the grounding um, uh, grounding will improve your sleep tremendously but once you ground and you do restore it's like crazy you mm -hmm. sleep so deeply or restore alone many people say that their sleep has deepened the dreams now here's another thing the dreams are phenomenal People say they go to sleep and they dream like these Hollywood movies and novels. And I believe <laughs> they gave us stupid Hollywood movies when the they took off the ground. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to find out because I, the order is in and it's on its way to my door right now. So we're going to find out. All right. Randy will give us a, 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 we'll give you a, a full a, report. 
a weekly update on uh, the progress with Restore. Maybe I'll experiment with it too. We'll see. Yeah. So if you, I had one more question I wanted to ask you. Just you know, it's been something that we've been talking about a little bit more and more here on the show, and uh, even in some threads on Facebook. And I'm thinking about even you know doing a series of shows just you know about health and diet. What kind of diet do you eat? I'm just curious. I, Emily, I, as a little child, I never liked meat. I'm now vegan, but I couldn't stand eating meat. My parents would look at me and say, have a nice drumstick. And, you know, something like that every day. I had to eat my meat, but I hated it. And I'm very petite and small. And yeah. when I was a teenager, I became a vegetarian. Of course, I plied myself with cottage cheese and yogurt. But then after... A couple of decades, I became a vegan, and I know a lot of people are against the vegan diet, and I feel that it's the right one for me. Mm -hmm. I eat only really once a day, and Dr. Mercola, whose um, newsletter I subscribe to, has advocated for a while now the intermittent fasting, where you're supposed to go 14 to 16 hours every day without eating, and I eat a couple of tiny little um, whole wheat crackers. I don't have a problem with gluten. By the way, if you do restore, they say that after just a few days or weeks, you can take gluten again. Um, so that's very interesting to me. But I eat hardly any breakfast, and then I eat a decent dinner that's very, you know, high water volume, lots of raw salad stuff. And I love soups, I make soups all the time. And so I don't take in a ton of calories, but I believe, like right now, it's 12, 12. I'm hungry. I'm Me really too. Hungry. <laughs> but I think you're supposed to be hungry. It keeps you alert. If I eat, I want to just lie down. I want to rest. Mm. I cannot do a thing. I, I'm not, I don't want to think. I don't want to. So I eat, and then I wind down and go to sleep. So that's, that's my life. But I have tried. I tried to eat. I bought some free-range eggs at the farmer's market a couple of weeks ago, and I ate a hard-boiled egg. I didn't have a problem with that. I was a little afraid of this vitamin B12 issue. I bought something called Vegan Safe Vitamin B12. I don't know if it's working or not. But mm. I thought, let me eat an egg. Let me try. And then with the next hard-boiled egg, I made one of my erstwhile favorites. I made egg salad. Yes, I love it, too. <laughs> I had to throw oh, the yeah. rest out. I, I ate two bites. Yep. I couldn't eat anymore. I felt like I felt leaden for the rest of the day, of the night, and the next uh -oh. day. So I am stuck. I can eat one hard boiled egg, and then I have to take a month rest. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I don't know what to do. I, 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 so, it, you know, I agree with you that each, um, so I'm not anti vegan diet. I, I'm not a vegan or vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian for long periods of my life and a vegan for periods of my life. But I do agree that for each person, there is a, the right formula for them. Um, but it is interesting just to sort of hear what different people are doing. And um, I, in some ways, I tend to agree with you. I'm one of those people I'm hungry all the time. Like I, I'm very, very physical. I do a lot of exercise, and my, my job is physical. And so I'm kind of eating, but in small, small meals kind of all day long. Um, but I agree that sometimes I feel like I'm functioning better when I just sort of have a snack and one large meal a day. Um, that's actually how I feel as well. Yeah, that, yeah, I feel like I that I probably am at my best performance when I have like a mid morning snack and then like a large late afternoon or early evening kind of meal. Um, you know, uh, I'm one of those people that's hungry all the time though, so it's hard to sort of achieve that. <laughs> Let me inject something here. Yeah. This is not directed at anybody here, and it's not directed at anybody personally, but we had this wide ranging discussion on Facebook that went for days over veganism. And, and some people took what I posted as being anti-vegan. I was not. What I'm saying is that there's a political veganism out there that's pointed directly at people who are in the dietary uh, trenches, so to speak. In other words, they're people, I would call them people in transition, people who are moving from meat-based diets into maybe vegetarianism, maybe a more balanced um, diet towards organics. People are at different points in the process and the continuum. And I think it's important to remember that 
we have to we have to allow people to express that way. We encourage healthy diets, but you know, I I really my my post and I don't remember exactly what I posted, but it offended some people, which I do quite often. And it was designed to basically take some of the fire out of what I call the food Nazis, which are basically people who are accusing meat eaters of being killers and carnivores in a, in a very brutal way, sometimes with great detail. And I, I'm not in favor of that approach. I'm in favor of people finding what works for them in their diets and then moderating it, moving it, and being willing to change it. I think vegetarian and veganism is is an, an ideal in a lot of ways it's something that i'm still striving for myself but i want people to understand we have to be balanced in what we present as dietary choices versus a political agenda that i see being pointed at people who still are consuming what are now considered to be politically incorrect foods very well said randy yeah, they have all kinds of agendas. They are playing off each other. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm a vegan because I know I feel better being a vegan. And I eat something like um, between, I would say, a dozen and 20 different vegetables and spices mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. And I just learned to cook in very, you know, complex ways. Uh, and I use tons of ingredients all chopped up and I love chopping. That's the way I like to cook as well. That's, that's what I do. I make a lot of soups, a lot of things that you can do that have a lot of different things chopped up, spices, herbs, things yeah. like that. You should come over, Randy. <laughs> I should, but it's, a, it's, a, it's like a 4,000 mile drive for dinner. <laughs> I'll come over and try your soup. So you we're a little closer. Yes. You come, yes. you're much closer. Yeah. Get on your Ma Aladdin magic card. I'll get to California here pretty soon, don't worry. <laughs> I, have, I have jump room technology, Sophia. I don't need a carpet. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, 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 we'll, we'll have lunch at some point. I, I, I love talking with you both in a private conversations and on the show, and it'll be lovely to sit down and, and have lunch with you sometime. Um, anything else that anybody wants to say before we wrap this up, please? I have a little story to tell, but I think I'm, it's best if I tell it off the air. Okay. <laughs> All okay. right. Leave uh, everybody hanging there. I know. It's terrible. Yeah, it's a, it's a, <laughs> that's a private conversation, you know. <clears throat> hey, maybe we'll share it. Um, so give out the websites one more time, Sophia, so yes. people know where to find you. Here's the deal. My um, information website is... At about the sky, A B O U T, the sky, not about this guy. That's what you're <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, about ladies. Sky, right? <laughs> about the sky.com. And the most active pages on that are my small storm blog, which you can also get with sophiasmallstorm.com. Remember, Sophia is with an F. And then my stores, I have two avatarproducts.com. That's where you'll find the biggest selection. I make cell phone shielding cases. You can put your phone in a shielded case, and that way it protects your body from the intermittent spurts, the you know, continued contact with cell towers. You also can get all kinds of products that I've tested myself that work really well. They're amazing household cleaners. Magnesium cream and iodine and Restore are my best sellers. And then I created a more... Um, sophisticated website called survivalmodestore.com and that one has a lot of the best sellers from avatar products so you're welcome that has a one-click buy for restore you're welcome to try anything there or anything at my avatar products website you can subscribe to my newsletter if you want to try that out that is a minimum fifty dollar donation a year and that's where you get all this, you know, burning information that I've cobbled together every month. So thank you for the opportunity. You guys have been absolutely great. And I think Emily and Randy, I'm going to just give you free subscriptions to my newsletter and a special deal on Restore if you decide you want to try it. So thank you very much. It's been okay. wonderful. Well, thank you. And you're welcome back anytime, Sophia. We, we love talking with you. So. You, you offer up a lot of important um, information and insights into this, into, you know, whatever this community that we're all part of is. 
And um, I think the most important thing is that you, you really, you really model um, individual, creative, abstract thinking at its best. And uh, you're a role model for me. And I know so many others that I speak to just love your mind and the way you think. And so we're always happy to talk about anything you like with you. Yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been awesome, enlightening, and uh, I think uh, a great conversation. So that's going to close it out for this time. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. Don't forget, by the way, the Patreon site, which is Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media. Um, go over there and see if that makes sense for you. We've got a, several different levels and it is time to begin supporting free and independent media. The truth is out there. It's inside you. We'll be back with another show very soon. This is Off Planet Radio.